three. Fast and Steve die. In the first Atwoods video, you observed an experiment for the purposes of determining an unknown mass. In the second Atwoods video, you obtained further data to do error analysis and you observed another experiment with clothespins for the purposes of determining the mass of the clothespins. And in this third Atwoods video, I will be going over the theoretical analysis of an ideal Atwoods, including use of a linear model to streamline the process of analyzing an Atwoods machine. I will also go over the theoretical application of the conservation of energy to calculate the unknown mass. Quantified results will be reserved for the final video. I will begin an in-depth look at the sources of error in this video, focusing on simplifying assumptions that were made in the ideal Atwoods machine analysis. In the final video, I will investigate procedural errors. I will investigate the massless string approximation and give my conclusion as to whether it is a significant source of error. I will also investigate the massless pulley approximation and give quantified results. And finally, I go into a fairly in-depth look at the frictionless pulley approximation and develop a theoretical framework that will be incorporated in the final video to determine if friction was a significant source of error. Welcome to Atwood's Machine a Deep Dive 3. Let's take a look at a basic Atwood's Machine uh, analysis of an Atwood's Machine. We're going to start off taking a look at uh, the uh, an ideal Atwood's Machine and then uh, go from there. Uh, first, let's take a look at uh, We'll take a look at uh, the, the brute force method of analyzing that. See, I got a little prop here. The that was machine right here. Um, so we've got in our uh, experiment, we had uh, we had two masses on this side, and we had one mass on this side, like that. All right, uh, I'm going to call this uh, mass one, and this will be mass two. Uh, those were about 100 grams each, and then we had the unknown mass we were trying to find out. Let's call it M3. All right, so uh, we'll just, uh, this is a basic, just a Newton's second law problem, Newton's second and third law. Um, so I'm going to circle the objects of interest, and uh, so we had this one, and we had uh, that one. We're going to look at those two. Um, and uh, so for this first one, we're going to uh, say that uh, we had uh, two forces down. Uh, we had M, well, it's one force, but two masses. Um, M1 and M3 together, G down. And then upward, we had the tension force, like that. And uh, this is our y-axis, and this is our x-axis. And we'll do something similar over here, where we had the y-axis. And the x-axis, down we had uh, M2G, and then up we had our tension force. Now let's take a moment to think about um, how big should I draw those vectors. Uh, let's see. Uh, this thing right here, right, we have, uh, we have more mass on this side, right? So it's kind of like, you know, I actually have one. We're going to look at that. So this is going to, oh, not going to do that. Right, so I'm going to put that on there, and this thing's going to accelerate like that, right? All right, so uh, we're going to get an acceleration like this, and they're going to accelerate together, right? This, this whole thing, they move together. Um, now, they're moving in opposite directions, but if, if the one on the right moves uh, two centimeters up, uh, the one on the left move, moves, moves two centimeters down, right? So they're moving together. Um, so uh, I will call this, now this is just acceleration, but why don't I call this uh, acceleration two and call this one acceleration one because this involves mass one, that involves mass two. And uh, they're going to accelerate together, uh, but in opposite direction. So I'm going to have my acceleration constraint. So A2 is positive, so I'll make this positive, equals negative A1. There's our acceleration constraint. Um, they're in opposite directions, uh, equal in magnitude. So, but, okay, so this one's going to accelerate up. Therefore, 
this tension shouldn't be the same size as that. I just probably drew that a little big. Let's let's adjust that. Let's adjust that. That tension is not going to equal. Oh, that's not right. It's already up. That's that's the wrong way. It's this way. The tension has to be bigger so that it accelerates upward. Uh, is that bigger? That's bigger. That's getting messy. That's okay. Life's messy. All right. So we got that. And uh, so I better make this one bigger too. And I'm going to, these are going to be equal. They're, they're as if they're Newton's third law pairs. Of course, they're not Newton's third law pairs because Newton's third law pairs would be uh, in opposite direction. These are in the same direction, but they're in equal in magnitude. Um, so they act as if they're Newton's third law pair. So I'm going to draw this line here to show that they are equal in magnitude. Now that's only true if this is an ideal Atwood's machine. And of course that is true if the string has no mass and the pulley has no mass and there's no friction on the pulley. So we're going to have to investigate those a little further, but right now let's just analyze the ideal Atwood's machine. All right, let's apply Newton's second law here. Uh, we know that the uh, sum of the forces equal mass times acceleration. That's the general uh, case. In this case, we're going to look at the components in the y direction. Sum of the forces in the y equals mass 1 is, which is m1 plus m3 times the acceleration of 1. All right. Well, the forces are just uh, tension minus the weight, which is m1 plus m3g equals m1 plus m3a1. All right. So then uh, we're going to do the same thing over here. Some of the forces in the y direction for 2 equals m2a2. And again, we have tension up minus uh, m2g equals m2a2. All right, so then we just need to solve this. Um, now, we're looking for the unknown is m3 in our experiment. Uh, so we're looking for m3. Uh, let's see, we know, we're going to know m1 and m2. So let's see what we know. We know m1, m1, uh, and we know m2. We know all those. And uh, do we know m3? No, we don't. One, no m3. Uh, we know g. Uh, tension we don't know. Uh, we'll be able to get that from our video. And uh, we're going to be able to get that from our video. Boom. All right. So we got it. We just got two unknowns. We got uh, two equations, two unknowns, uh, tension, and uh, M3. And we're going to solve for M3. All right. Shouldn't be too bad. The algebra might get a little tricky, but let's see what we got. I think I will solve this for T and just plug it into here and see what we get. Uh, all right. So I got uh, T equals m2a2 plus m2g. All right. Now, what am I going to uh, solve for? Um, I think I'm going to have everything in terms of a2. Uh, since uh, a2 is going to be a positive value, I'm just going to solve everything in terms of a2. All right. So uh, let's take this. And plug it into here. We just got a little algebra ahead of us. Nothing too complicated. Probably take a few steps though. Right? I'm going to take that and plug it right into there. All right. Let's see what we got. And I decided I'm going to solve for A2. So I'm going to make this A2. Uh, but I need to make this a negative. Because A1 is negative A2. All right, so then I just got to clean this up a little bit. Uh, maybe I'll do it up there because I'm going to rapidly run out of space. I can see that right now. Uh, I got to make sure I don't speak too loudly because I'm very close to the microphone. Um, all right, so I want to just solve from three. All right, and algebra wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. It's M3. All right, here's our solution. Uh, right, there's our solution, uh, setting up uh, uh, two separate free body diagrams, um, applying Newton's second law, using Newton's third law to see that the tensions are the same, so we could just call those T, combining them, 
and solving for m3 because uh, we'll, we should know the acceleration in that. All right, so we got that right there. Uh, I think I'll... Uh, now, I want to show you a, uh, a simpler way to do this. It requires a, 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 a sort of a trick um, where we're going to adjust the directions of the forces and take advantage of the, uh, the fact that all a pulley does is change the direction, ideal pulley anyways, it just changes the direction of the tension force. Right, I got the tension force uh, is pulling down on this side of the pulley, and this side uh, uh, down, and also on this side of the pulley. Uh, but the tensions are the same, so it's just changed the direction of the force. All right, so let's take a look at uh, how we could kind of simplify our analysis of an Atwood's machine. Um, and what we're going to do is, rather than you know the, the traditional way is to to analyze it like that and like we did before, um, but uh, there's a little trick we can do which could uh, kind of simplify and speed things up a little bit. Why don't we just look at it like this, right? Instead of it like this, let's go like this, where one side of gravity is pulling it to the left and the other side is pulling it to the right, right? So um, we're going to do that. We're going to say, all right, why don't we just say, that this is an object like this. So we've got, we got our mass, M1, and connected to that we had M3, and then we had another mass, M2, and there were, and then we had our pulley, right? I could just draw our pulley here. Our pulley is not really involved because it's an ideal pulley, it has no friction, and it has no uh, mass, so it has no moment of inertia. So um, we kind of don't even need the pulley. I'm going to put it there anyways because we're going to need it later because we're going to need to look at that a little la later. I'll leave it there. But that's a massless pulley and a frictionless pulley, so it doesn't affect anything. So the only force is we have this system, and there's a force this way. Uh, we have Fg this way, of course, which is M2g, and it's pulling that way. Now, I know it's actually pulling down. I know that. But and, uh, we could just think of it as pulling this way, right? It's pulling that way on the rope or the, the string or whatever. And then this way, uh, run out of room, we got FG, call it FG1, call this FG2, equals uh, M1 plus M3G, right? So we got two forces, one pulling this way, and one pulling that way. This one's pulling more. So of course this thing's gonna accelerate this, more, uh, this way. We only have one acceleration in this case uh, because they're both moving in the same direction. It's different than this, right? Because we went like that. So. If one's moving to the right, the other's moving to the right. One's moving to the left, the other's moving to the left, instead of up and down. And um, we don't need an acceleration constraint, right? Well, the acceleration, it's all just one thing. It's just one thing. We got three masses and a massless string and a massless pulley and a frictionless pulley. So there we go. All right, so we got this. Well, that's kind of easy. We're just going to apply Newton's second law. We don't need the third law, right? So we go to the sum of forces equal mass times acceleration. Um, all right, and uh, so what are, what are the sum of the forces? Well, we got two forces. We got uh, this one is positive. We got M2G is positive, and this one's negative, minus M1 plus M3G equals the total mass, right? What's the total mass? M1 plus M2 plus M3. That's, a, that's the mass. Oops, that's a, that's a three times acceleration, and there's only one acceleration. All right, well, that was easier. That was easier. Um, so uh, now we just want to solve this for, for M3. All right, so hopefully we get the same answer. We'll get all M3s on the other side, I think. M2G minus M1G minus M1 plus M2A equals M3A plus M3G. Let's just solve that for M3. M2 minus M1G minus M1 plus M2A, all divided by uh, A plus G equals M3. All right, does that give us the same answer as that? Because they don't look the same. Um, but are they? I don't know. Well, let's see. Um, because this we have A plus G, and this is G minus A. Well, we have to look at what A's we're dealing with here, and uh, we'll see that they are the same, I think. 
All right, so in this case, um, we solve for A2, right? So um, A2 was like that, right? It went up like that. And this was a positive value, right? That was a positive value for A2. So you had G, let's say it was, let's say it was one meter per second squared, right? So you'd, you'd go 9.8 minus one meter per second squared because that's a positive value. Now, in this case, it was accelerating this way. And if this was also uh, one meter per second squared, it would be minus one meter per second squared, right? In this case, it was positive one meter per second squared. Right. So now when we plug this in, this is going to be negative, right? Negative one meter per second. So again, we have a subtraction. And then the same thing here. This is negative, so this is a plus, And uh, this was positive, so it stays positive. So they are the same answer. They give the same answer. We just had a different orientation because in this case, the acceleration was this way. And this way, it was the acceleration we saw for A2. And the acceleration was up like that. All right, so there you go. Um, this is uh, an easier way, but you, you, you need to, you only want to use that if you understand how it works. Um, so think about this. This is a, a very effective technique to streamline your calculations for a, uh, a, uh, an Atwoods machine. Uh, and we're going to see that we're going to be also going to be able to incorporate um, mass to the pulley and friction a little later in this model. Um, you could do it in that model too, uh, but a little more work. So, all right, let's uh, let's take a look at the uh, solving this thing with conservation of energy. We had our Atwoods machine, and just as it would be good practice to to uh, uh, do this with conservation of energy. All right, to solve for M two uh, using conservation of energy, let's uh, let's start off with our drawing again. We got our Atwoods machine. All right, we had uh, our mass M two. This is M1, and this was M3. And we wanted to know what M3 was. We released them, and we were able to time how long it takes to drop. Um, all right, well, let's, uh, let's set the gravitational potential energy equal to zero here. Um, and uh, what we're going to be able to get from our video is we're going to be able to find the, uh, the velocity, right, or the speed of the thing uh, coming down. And uh, if we know that, we should be able to calculate that mass. So anyways, um, so this would be uh, time uh, zero. And then a little later, when it gets to the bottom, we got uh, M2, or M1, I'm sorry, M1 and M3 have made it to the bottom. And... And at this point, M2 is up in the air. Looks sort of like that. All right. So uh, I will call this uh, time zero and time one. Right. So I'm going to say, okay, energy at zero equals the energy at one. Now, if it's a, uh, we said there's no friction and... Uh, there's no mass, so there's going to be no energy in the pulley. Uh, so uh, mechanical energy is conserved, and the only type of energy we're going to have, we're going to have changes in gravitational potential energy, and we're also going to have um, uh, kinetic energy. So we start off, if I'm calling gravitational potential energy zero here, and um, now, I mean, I could put it at the center of mass, but I'm just going to measure everything from the bottom, because we only care about changes in gravitational potential energy so um, we're just uh, we're always going to measure everything from the bottom and uh, so initially we have uh, the uh, gravitational potential energy of one uh, ug1 at uh, time zero plus the gravitational potential energy of three at zero um, plus uh, zero. This has no energy at this point. It's not moving. doesn't have any height. And then when we get to here, um, this has lost all its gravitational potential energy. And I know this isn't um, all the way to here, but this has lost the same amount of height 
So we're going to, that's also zero gravitational potential energy when it gets there. So um, these two have zero gravitational potential energy when they get here, but that doesn't. We do have uh, gravitational potential energy for uh, two at time one. Plus they all have kinetic energy, right? Plus the kinetic energy of one, plus the kinetic energy of two, plus the kinetic energy of three, right? They're all moving at this point. It, Bing, 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 bing. Go ahead, stop the problem right before it hits. It hasn't hit the ground yet. It's right before. All right. So, uh, again, we start off with uh, gravitational potential energy for these two. And then when we get to the bottom, uh, we do have the gravitational potential energy of one. That's gained. And then these have lost. Now, uh, you could also, theoretically, but I think it's a lot more work, um, you could have just checked out the center of mass and saw how the center of mass moved. Um, but uh, we're going to use this technique instead. So I have uh, mg, m1g, h0, uh, plus m2g, h0. Oop, that's a 3. That's a 3. Uh, and then this one is just mg, m2g, H. We're just gonna call it H. We'll call this. We'll call this height H. Right from the lowest point to the highest point, we will call that H. Right, call that H. Um, now, um, even though M three doesn't make it as low as M one, it also falls H. Right, because uh, in this case, H would be this would which would be the same as that H. So they're going to fall the same amount. All right, M2G. And this goes up that amount H. Plus one half M1 V1 squared plus one half M2 V2 squared plus one half M3 V3 squared. These are speeds, and they're all the same. So I could actually uh, just kind of get rid of the subscripts. I get rid of these. Don't need this. The heck is that? The heck is that? That's not right. Let's fix that. That's one half. Not one over M3. One half. M3 V squared. All right, so let's just get... Uh, Let's get M3 by itself. That's M3. Let's get M3 by itself. So I think uh, we'll bring this over here and bring that over there. And that's going to be kind of easy. M3GH equals M2 minus M1. G H plus one half M one plus M two V squared, just combining these terms. Right? You can factor out the one half and the V. Oh, I didn't leave room over here to bring this over. So we're gonna go plus a negative one half M three v squared. A little awkward, but anyways, that's okay. Did I take into everything? I kind of got this, and it got that, and it got that, and I think we're good. All right, so we'll factor out the M3. M3 times GH minus uh, v squared over 2 equals M2 minus M1 GH plus one half M one plus M two V squared. All right, I think we're gonna kind of get rid of that fraction, and then we'll be done. We'll be done. Let's just simplify that a little bit, because that's just kind of ugly. We're gonna multiply top and bottom by two. All right, so there we go. Uh, we know M one, M two. We know the height. 
of the drop. Uh, we know V squared, which is at the bottom. Let's be at the bottom. And there we go. All right, so we could use that to find M2. Uh, we, hopefully we get a uh, similar answer um, as we did before. So there we go. We could solve that using conservation of energy. And, uh, and uh, there's the basic solution right here. M3 should equal that. Let's see, does that work? We've got meters per second squared, meters per second squared. Okay, meters squared per second squared. And we have the same thing here. So those will divide out and we'll just end up with kilograms. All right, units work. So it might be right. All right, so there's, uh, this is conservation of energy, solving with conservation of energy. You should have got a result that kind of looked like that. All right. So let's, uh, let's take a look at our data, plug things in, see what we got. Okay, let's take a look at uh, some of the assumptions we made in this lab. Um, we, it was at a, an ideal Atwood's machine. Uh, so one of the things we assumed was the string was massless. Now let's talk about why that's important. Um, is it because of the weight, right? If, the, if this string uh, had mass, then it would also have weight. Um, and when it's like this, um, not only would this side have this mass pulling down, but it would have the weight of all this pulling down too. Um, but that's really not probably as important. Uh, uh, the, the impact of mass isn't as important due to its weight because if you take a look, when the thing falls down like this, Okay, so now the weight is helping this side. So um, I don't even think it would affect this, the overall speed of the thing. If we, uh, if we took a look at this, we said, okay, let's, say the, uh, let's take a look at this from an energy standpoint. If this was the uh, center of mass of the string, I don't know what that actually is, but let's say it was. It seems like a reasonable place for the center of mass of the string. So the center of mass starts about right there. Uh, when the experiment starts, then the thing accelerates down because it had extra weight on this one side and went like that. And then we could see that the center of mass is still here at one. So it hasn't really moved. The fact that this has weight, it doesn't affect its change in gravitational potential energy. So the gravitational potential energy isn't going to change because I remember that the change in gravitational potential energy is uh, like that. So it's how much does the weight change its height? And in this case, um, the weight of the string wouldn't change its height. So there wouldn't be a, a change in gravitational potential energy, um, which is uh, in gravitational potential energy is determined by an object's weight, how much it's being pulled down. Now, one thing it would affect, though, from an energy standpoint, is the kinetic energy, right? This string would be moving, so it would have kinetic energy, uh, which is one-half mv squared. So it's moving, and if it has mass, then it has kinetic energy. So we would have to take that into account. Um, now, this is what we would call the inertial mass. So what's really important in the massless string approximation is how it changes the system's inertia, more so than the weight, right? This is inertial mass, and this is gravitational mass, uh, right? Uh, this one affects how much it, um, something's being pulled down uh, because it's near another object of mass, and this is uh, the mass that makes something reluctant to change its motion. Um, so really, it has to do with inertial mass as far as the massless sp sp spring or string approximation. Um, so then, again, if we looked at, uh, using Newton's laws, if we looked at our system like this, um, if we have uh, M1 and uh, I guess I'll put our M3 here M3 and M2 right um, if this has mass not only do we have to accelerate M1 M3 and M2 but we also have to accelerate the string if the string doesn't have any mass it require no force uh, no unbalanced force to accelerate a massless string. So really that's what massless string is about. It's really about does the string have inertia? And um, it turns out that the mass of this string 
was 0.2 grams, right? So it wasn't that string. Uh, that's not the one we use. Uh, but m uh, mass of the string, when I put it on the scale, said 0.2 grams. All right. So the question is, is that a significant, uh, significant amount of mass? Um, uh, and the system, because, you know, the acceleration equals F net divided by mass. All right. So that's the mass. Where, that's a system mass. And we want to see if that's going to affect the acceleration. Well, the, the mass of the whole system, this was 200 grams. Uh, this was 200 grams. This was 20 grams. Let's compare the mass of the system. Let's find the percent uh, difference between the mass of the system with the string and without the string. So uh, with the string, let's see, so percent difference of the masses is going to be, um, so we had, this was 200 grams, this one turned out to be 20 grams, and this was 200 grams. So we had 420 grams, 420 grams minus if we include the string, that's going to be 420.2 grams. Okay, so that's the difference, absolute value, and then we'll find the average, which is 420 plus 420.2 divided by 2. Multiply that all by 100, right? So the difference divided by the average multiplied by 100 should give us that percent difference. I got 0.048% difference. Uh, that is insignificant. That is an insignificant uh, difference uh, between the mass of the system uh, with a string and without. Uh, so uh, that is effectively a massless string um, that would not affect our result. Uh, other problems will affect it, but not that. That's not an issue. So massless string, and you need to do this. You need to say, is this significant? Well, let's see. Uh, the system without it, compared to the system with it, there's a 0.048% uh, difference. So no, that's not going to cause a significant change. So massless string is not a factor. Massless string is a good approximation. That's a good approximation. Very good approximation that's really not gonna affect that result in any significant way. Moment of inertia, so we had massless, we had the massless pulley, right? And uh, that has to do with, um, uh, does it have a moment of inertia um, that's significant? Um, basically, does some of the energy go into causing this rotation? Um, or does it uh, take a net torque to cause this to turn? Um, to cause this to speed up or slow down would require a net torque if that has mass. So um, it, we can approximate that as a cylinder or as a disc. I equals one half m r squared. Now I know what you're thinking. It's not exactly a disc, and you're right. It's not exactly a disc, but it's kind of like a disc. Let's see what the numbers give us and see if we need to take. Uh, the fact that it's not exactly a nice smooth disc into account. Um, uh, the mass of the disc was 9.4 grams. All right, so that's one half uh, 0 0.0094 kilograms uh, times the radius squared. And the radius I got was 2.5 centimeters or point. 0.025 meters, right? So we got that uh, for measurements, and that comes out to 2. Point, I'll go 94 times 10 to the minus 6 kilogram meters squared. Let's see how we would use that. I'm gonna write that up here. All right, so uh, let's do an analysis with that. It seems like a small number, but let's do some physics to see if it really is small. What we need to do is uh, set up our uh, Atwood's machine again. So now we have a mass. We have a, a pulley with a mass, right? So here's our pulley, and it now has mass. So I'm just gonna analyze this again. And uh, we know how to do that. 
I'm taking into account the rotation of our pulley with mass. So we got uh, M1, M3, M2. All uh, right, we're going to get our free by diagrams. Get, things going to be a little more complicated this time, though. Down, we got M3 plus M1, G. And we got T. I'm going to call that tension one. Tension one. Uh, down, we have uh, M2, G. And up, we have T, 2. Uh, now this is going to accelerate down, so that one needs to be a little bigger, and that one's a little bigger than that, and that's it. Now, these are not Newton's third law pairs here, because these tensions are not the same, because this has mass. If these tensions were the same, there would be no torque on that, so if it stayed at rest, it would remain at rest, um, but it doesn't. We can see that it didn't in our experiment. So what do we have here? We have pulling down, we have T2. And pulling down, we have T1. So we're going to need to apply Newton's second law for rotation. Some of the torques equal I alpha. All right. And uh, alpha is going to be this way. All right. Uh, this is going to be a radius R. And what we end up with is the torque here is the tension one, and this is gonna be a positive torque, T1 R, and then this is gonna to tend to rotate this, so this is gonna be T2 R equals moment of inertia about its center uh, times alpha. And then here, what do we have? Some of the forces equal mass times acceleration in general. These are vectors, by the way. Um, so some of the forces, look at the components, equal uh, M1 plus M3 A1, T1, minus M1 plus M3 G equals M1 plus M3 A1. Some of the forces in the Y equals m2 a2 so we have t2 minus m2 g equals m2 a2 all right um but these are all related to each other um they all kind of moving in unison so we need our acceleration constraint this is gonna be negative negative a1 equals positive a2 that one's up. Equals, and that's going to give me a positive alpha R. All right, there's our acceleration constraint. Uh, so we should be able to solve that then. We have two tensions we don't know. We don't know mass M3. Keep in mind, we know mass M1 and 2, and we can get the acceleration uh, from our uh, video. So, uh, we have three equations and three unknowns, right? All right. Uh, I have a lot of room over here, so why don't I uh, want to do this? I want to say that uh, T2 equals M2A2 plus M2G. And then T1, oh, I should add a one on it. T1 equals... M1 plus M3 times A1 plus G. Let's solve for A2. Right, because that one is positive. All right, let's solve for A2. We're going to get everything in terms of A2. Let's uh, rewrite this. I'm going to slide this over a little bit. Kind of got in the way. I'm going to go uh, T1 minus T2 times R equals moment of inertia times alpha. All right. Uh, so uh, T1, what is that? T1 is M1 plus M3. A1, 
but I'm going to get rid of A1. I don't want A1. I'm going to say uh, minus A2, because that's what A1 is, right? A1 is the opposite of A2. Minus or plus G. Right? I had A1 plus G, so now it's minus A2 plus G. M minus this whole thing, which is uh, M2 A2 plus G. And this whole thing times R. R equals I alpha equals A2 over R. Alpha equals A2 over R. We can bring that R over and make that R squared. Let's isolate M3. Uh, so we'll go like this. We'll say, uh, I'm going to distribute this. I'm going to say M1 times G minus A2 plus M3 times G minus A2 minus M2 G plus A2, might as well get them all in the same order, equals I A2 over R squared. All right, so we can get uh, M3 by itself. We've got to subtract these two from that side and divide by that. We should be able to get M3 equals I A2 over R squared. Oop, not R2, R squared. Uh minus m2 g plus a2 minus m1 g minus a2 all divided by g minus a2 uh, that's not right that should have been a minus and then that should have been plus all right, so I made a mistake there. There was a, that should have been a minus, and that makes that a plus. All right, I'm gonna, I'm running out of room here, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna erase this, because I'm gonna need some space to plug my numbers in. So what do we end up? We end up with like point zero zero three six seven. Okay, so the real question is, if this was zero, we would get, um, if I equals zero, then this gave me M3 is 16.5 grams. All right, so um, it would give us 16.5 uh, grams if, uh, if the moment of inertia is zero. If it's uh, this value, then it gave us 16.9. And what's the difference between those two? So this gives us uh, two about 2.4 percent difference. 2.4 percent difference. Uh, that may be significant. Uh, that could add up to a whole bunch of errors. So uh, the massless uh, pulley approximation uh, gave us 2.4. So that might be significant, like 2 percent. That might add up. All right. So uh, Massless string was a good approximation. The massless pulley might be a problem a bit. It's gonna, we're gonna be off by uh, 2% and you start adding 2% up and you've got a significant error there. So that is something to look into. Uh, the mat, the uh, moment of inertia of the pulley is, uh, could be something to, that we need to be worried about. All right, All right let's take a look at the uh, frictionless pulley approximation. Uh, clearly in our setup, uh, it wasn't a frictionless pulley um, because if you saw in the video, the uh, if you got the thing moving, um, you could see that it, it would stop, right? So that means it's slowing down, um, and that means there must be a uh, some sort of force causing it to slow down. It's accelerating, right? If um, if it wasn't accelerating, once I got it going, it would just keep moving at constant velocity. Um, so there's an unbalanced force on this thing. Um, now, when we say frictionless pulley, what are we talking about? Friction where? Um, because really what they're uh, talking about with frictionless pulley is they're talking about the bearing. Um, that the bearing, uh, that the, the axle that the pulley moves on 
is a frictionless axle. Um, even though the bearing itself doesn't directly uh, apply any force to the string because it's actually the hub that applies the force to the string, uh, which affects the motion of our of our blocks. Now, right now we have uh, these these masses are pretty well balanced. They're about 200 grams a piece, and um, so we would expect this to uh, stay uh, still. Uh, they were there was a slight difference when I put them on the scale, but it was really only um, a fraction of a gram uh, mass difference. Um, so here I have five grams, and I'm going to put this on. And uh, oh, all right. So actually, the impulse caused it to move a little bit, but now we see that it's at rest. It shouldn't be at rest. It should. This should be accelerating down. So um, clearly, something's going on here. Let's take a look at what's going on. I think it's it. It's usually easier to look at this uh, with the linear model rather than looking at it directly like this. So what we're going to do is use that linear model that we used before, where instead of looking at the our uh, system like this. Let's look at it like this, all right? So um, let's take a look. We got um, we got a, a mass here, and uh, let's assume we did we don't have that we have equal masses like that, and uh, so you know our systems like this, like this. And uh, it is rolling along a pulley. So I'm going to put the pulley there. Like that. All right. And uh, if this is uh, FG, we have our system like this. And, um, you know, we played a little trick. It just makes it easier to look at it this way. Why don't I call this uh, M1? We'll call this M2, right? So our system really is this, M1 and M2, kind of like that. And um, uh, the force is due to the weight of these things. And if I go like this, so it has a velocity this way. So this has a velocity like that. And this has a velocity like that. So in this case, our velocity is like this. So we had this thing, and it had a velocity this way, right? The whole system's moving that way when I'm pushing it down. Like, right now, that's what's going on. Now, clearly, it's slowing down and stopping. So therefore, we have an acceleration this way. It's slowing down, right? So there's an acceleration in the opposite direction of the velocity. And... Uh, if we take a look at this, this should be balanced um, if we just look at these two forces. It should be balanced. Um, but it's not because it's accelerating that way. So there must be an unbalanced force that way. And um, it must be coming from this because that's the only thing left there. We've got the wheel turning like that. And what it is is it's friction with this hub. There is friction, and the friction must be there must be a frictional force this way, right? Now, I probably made that too big. It's not that big of a friction force, but I just wanted to make sure you could see it. So we have a frictional force that way, which is static friction with the hub, right? This is static friction. Um, the, the rope is not sliding relative to the, the hub of the, of the uh, pulley. So we have a unbalanced force that way, and that's why it accelerates. Um, now, if we only knew what that was, because where is this originating from? This is static friction, but it's due to a torque which is being caused by kinetic friction. So this friction should remain constant as this thing's rolling, depending, regardless of the speed of this thing, this should remain constant. Um, it's this way, this way. If I went like this, it would switch directions. But its magnitude should stay uh, the same because it's due to the uh, torque with the axle. Now, the torque with the axle is not applying the force, but the force exists because the torque exists. Um, let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, 
like right now I could I if this thing's moving like this right actually let me let me put an unbalanced force on this so I'll put a significant unbalanced force on this right and this thing's gonna uh, that's too much that's too significant that's too significant let's go that's significant all right so I got this and uh, what I can do is what my finger is doing right now is it's not applying a force to the string it's applying a force, a frictional force, in this case, kinetic friction with the uh, pulley, right? So it's applying a force and I'm actually applying a force this way, right? And what that is doing is that's causing a torque on this thing. So what I'm doing, we have this thing, and we had a bigger force on this side and less force on that side. And um, we had the axle here. I was applying a force here, right? And that force, I'll use red for my finger. I was applying a force downward. And that was causing this thing to be reluctant to rotate because that force was applying a torque a torque about this point because this is my r axis right so there was a torque uh, my force was at uh, right angles to the position vector relative to the point of rotation and i could change how much torque i'm applying by so i could apply a force by using this pen. If I apply the force here, I really have to push hard and I can't, it's not easy to stop it without really pushing hard. On the other hand, if I'm out on the edge, it's much easier, right? When I move in, it's harder because I'm applying less torque even though my force is still significant. The axle is applying a torque and because it's applying a torque, um, it's causing this to want to slow down and it's reluctant to rotate and therefore it's applying a static friction force uh, on the string, the hub is. Uh, so, so we got something like that. Now we would like to know what that is because if we knew what that frictional force was, we could actually um, compensate for that. So um, what I did in the experiment is I kept adding masses. I added, kept adding more force to this side. Let me move this frictional force down here. Let me make it a little smaller too, because that was kind of big. It wasn't that big. So there's my friction force, right? And that's occurring at the axle, but we can move a vector wherever we want. So we have a force like that. We want to know how big that is. So what I did was I said, all right, well, if I want to know how big that is, why don't I just keep adding forces to this side? Because that's easy to do. All I had to do is add paper clips, right? I could just keep adding weights to this side until it moved with constant velocity. So what I'm gonna do is add another force on this side. I just keep adding paper clips. So I'll call that force of paper clips. In the experiment, I just kept adding those until this thing seemed to move with constant velocity. Now, if it's moving with constant velocity, if I get rid of this, if it's no longer accelerating, if it's moving with constant velocity, I know that this is balancing that force, and then I know what the force of friction is. Now, once I know what the force of friction is, all I need to do is do a quick analysis to figure out, because remember, what we were trying to do is in our experiment, we had another mass here, which I was calling M3, we had M3, and I can get rid of my paper clips. Now I can analyze this. If I know um, M1, M2, and F, I can figure out what the force due to the M3 weight is, and uh, then I would know what the mass is. All right? So uh, that was the idea, right? So all we need to do is go like this. We need to say, okay, some of the forces... Uh, equals uh, mass times acceleration, right? So uh, what we had, we had uh, m1 plus m2 plus m3 times the acceleration. 
Um, and I know what that is because I had my paper clips and I had them. I had the system moving at constant velocity. So uh, it was in that force we had to the left we had m one g plus m three g, and that's to the left. So let's make that negative plus m two g plus f friction equals m one plus m2 plus m3 uh, times the acceleration. Um, so we knew the acceleration, we knew these two, uh, we figured that out because that was the, this right here was the weight of the paper clips. Weight of clips, I'll just call it clips. The weight of the clips and uh, uh, we had M2, so we could solve that for M3, and that's the idea. And uh, so now that we know this, uh, we can actually uh, solve that. Uh, I'm not going to spend the time to solve that right now. There was a setup. I'll, I'll leave the algebra to you. All right, so um, that was the idea of that experiment where I, where I got the thing moving at constant velocity, and, uh, and the weight of the clips should have represented the static friction of the string on the hub and uh, solving for that hopefully uh, you got something like that. Now one question that I had which is a really important one to think about um, as we're trying to understand rotation and torques and things like that is um, why could they even consider that a reasonable bearing just uh, a hunk of metal shoved into a hunk of plastic. Well, it's certainly not a sophisticated bearing. It was just this pin bearing uh, going in like that. And uh, I had a close-up of the video, if you could see that. Why is that a reasonable bearing uh, in a situation like that? You know, that just seems like a terrible, like, you know, usually nice bearings. You got the, the ball bearings and all that stuff, and you can get one that goes forever. Um, it seems to have really low friction. Let's take a look why, why it is kind of reasonable to, to, uh, to use this pin bearing. Here's our, uh, our pulley, and in the center we had this just kind of this divot and a pin, this pointy thing that just went in the, in the divot. I'm going to make this a little bigger just so I can draw. Let's say it was this big. Right, that's awfully big. Um, the point of this is that it can't be big, but anyways, um, so let's say this thing was rotating like this. Let's say it had a rotation in that direction. Now, um, inside that bearing, yeah, as this thing's rotating around like that, and like this, here's, here's, my, here's my wheel, the, uh, the axle is rubbing on the, the, this little cutout, right? It's rubbing on there. So if this thing's spinning this way, and we got another thing inside of it, um, it's always applying, like where this point is touching, there is a force of friction this way, and where, where it's touching there, it's this way. So, and so all around here, there's friction, right? I'm only gonna draw four of them, but they exist all throughout, it's extended. It's like that. Um, and uh, there's a whole, you know, it's all around. Now I'm gonna get rid of uh, all of them except for one. Keep in mind that they're all here, like that. And, uh, well, actually, let me leave that there just to remind us. And let me redraw this like that. And just take a look at one of them. And it has friction like that. And now, this is applying a torque. This makes this reluctant to want to rotate. And uh, here's our position vector R. There's our position vector R. And the torque, of course, is R cross F. Right. So we want to take the right angle component of the friction um, and with R. And they are at right angles, all right? So um, is this a big torque? Well, the friction is going to be fairly large because it's just metal rubbing on plastic and that's not it's not lubricated or anything like that a good a really high sophisticated bearing would have ball bearings and they'd lubricate them and it would roll real nicely um, this it was dry and it was plastic on metal but the one thing it does have going for it because this f 
can be fairly large on that situation like that is the torque can't be too big because R is small. It's a very, very small area. So uh, the torque is reasonably small because R is reasonably small. Now I drew it big here just so you could see what's going on. Um, but, uh, and I wanted to do a quick demonstration how that works. I don't know. This is, I don't know if it's gonna work at all. All right, so what I have here, and we'll see how this works out. Um, we have a, uh, I have a, uh, a pencil with the eraser at the end because the eraser on plastic is kind of frictiony. And uh, what I wanted to do is kind of see if I could somehow keep a constant force on there. And what, it, what I'm doing is I got this metal ruler and it's just kind of leaning in on it. And let's see if I can slide it out and see if it makes a difference. Um, with the torque. So the idea is that I'm going to apply friction and as I move farther out, um, that the, uh, the torque will increase. All right. All right, so there. That's with the eraser towards the edge. And if I put the eraser towards the inside, you can see, I think that it's accelerating a greater rate on the inside because there's less torque, right? If I put the friction more outward, we can definitely see that there's more torque. Now that knobby thing keeps hitting. And in fact, that actually caused it to stop completely. If I moved it to the inside, that won't be able to do that. All right. So there you go. I don't know if that, was, if that helped at all, but you know, I spent a lot of time working on it, so you're going to see it. So there you go. There's my contraption. That took way too long to get to work, and uh, I don't think it worked that well. All right. So there you go. So um, actually having a pin bearing is a pretty good bearing. Um, it, it's real simple. It's cost effective. Now, the real problem with that bearing isn't so much it's friction or you know with the torque it applies it tends to be a little weak uh so they they break easily um but pin bearings are very uh, popular because because they're they, they work pretty well all right so there you go um and then we'll plug some numbers in later to see if uh if uh, friction was important whether this was a bad assumption Extreme. Fast and Steve die. Thank you.